it small because you guys can ask anything that you want. Um, typically, this time of year, I run a bunch of, uh, of these little, I, I usually run the forums every month anyway. We're getting back to that now that COVID's over, so it's nice to get, get people together, um, have these conversations, get some feedback on what people are concerned about. Um, but this time of the, the year, it's really about um, trying to make sure that people understand the budget, what we're asking for, and why. Um, so that'll be probably about 15 minutes, depending upon how many questions folks may have. And then we'll move into kind of just having a general feedback kind of discussion about the, uh, the, the homework policy that we're looking at. And that's a draft policy. It's not finalized by any means. Um, it's just kind of the starting point where we're at. And so there's similar discussions that are going on with um, the faculty, uh, as well as they've been having some advisories, uh, conversations with the um, students at the high school um, to get their feedback as well. But, and I'm going to apologize for a long day if I sit here and hold that. Um, but again, as we'll talk a little bit about the budget, maybe, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Um, and this is just kind of a broad overview. You know, um, it's, it's what we're bringing in for money. It's, it's what we're looking at for additional expenses next year. It's, you know, what the impact that the school district is actually having uh, on, on your taxes versus the, the bigger impact this year, which hopefully people are aware about, is the impact that the change in real estate values has had, because that, that's been marketed. So I, I've broken those out for, for part of this discussion. So a lot of it right now, um, kind of what we're looking at, you know, we're coming out of, of COVID. Uh, when we were in, in the COVID years, a lot of the effort and a lot of the funding was really designed to try to keep the kids from falling behind. Um, as best we could and to keep them safe. So that was the focus of the budget. We're coming out of COVID now, and right now we're, we're in what we're calling the recovery phase, right? We've got kids that, you know, because of quarantine, um, because of, you know, remote session, that there's lost learning. And so there's a lot of extra resources that have been, been there for the last year or two, trying to get the kids caught up on what they've lost. Um, so right now, um, the biggest goals uh, for the school um, is making sure that we're still pushing forward on the board's ends, right? You know, foundational knowledge and the core subjects, you know, critical thinking skills, um, all those things that, that the board, through its conversations with the community, has identified as important. Um, but the biggest thing, uh, in addition to that, that we're trying to manage is this catastrophic increase in taxes across the state um, that has happened because of the changes in property values. So during COVID, um, Vermont was actually a very nice haven for folks that were trying to get out of the local cities. Um, they would come here, they would telecommute, and all those people kind of moving into the area um, put a lot of demand um, on a housing stock that was already living. And so it's not unusual for um, the values of people's properties, you know, on an average price home to have gone up on um, and this is statewide. So that's a little bit of what, what, what we're going to talk about when we develop this budget. These are the things that we were kind of looking at, at, at trying to do for the community. So again, this is high level numbers and we can go into as much detail as folks want. So the current budget that we have this year, the one that we're living under is 22.1 million. What we're requesting for next year is 23.5. And so you'll see that this is a $1.3 million increase. Now, these are the expenses. This is what we're spending. At the same time, what's going on is we've been increasing our revenues. So while we're asking for a $1.3 million increase to help kind of support all the programs and things that we're doing for kids, we're also generating $2.3 million of, of new revenue. So that means our ask from the school side of things, from the taxpayers, we're actually asking for about a million dollars less from the taxpayers than we did last year. And last year was kind of similar, right? Um, we were spending more, but our revenues were up so much last year that we actually spent about a half a million dollars last, asked a half a million dollars less from the taxpayers last year. Yep. Are, are these revenues, the new revenue, is that state money, COVID money, or is that just due to increased? Um, it's a combination of things, and I can pull the detail out if you want. Um, I guess I'm asking because I'm curious to know whether it's kind of going to be an ongoing thing or that it's going to disappear. Yeah, and actually we're going to, we're going to hit on that in, in a, a little bit later. So there's, you've got the property yield is way up, 
And there's lots of ways to think about the property yield. Um, for us, the easiest way to think about it is it's how much we get from the state education fund per kid. It was 13,100 last year, so you know our 847 kids that we have, you know, we were getting about 13,100 from the state for it. This year it's 15,700, I believe. It's right on the tax sheet. And so we're getting an additional 2,000 something, you know, for every kid that's there. So that's a huge chunk of this 2.3 million in revenue. I think it was about $1.7 million. Um, we also generate a significant amount of revenue from students that pay tuition to come here because they want to come here. Um, that has been growing um, prior to COVID. It was in about the $250,000 a year range. It's up to $465,000. Um, so we've got a lot of revenue there. Um, there's a couple of other parts and pieces and savings there, there, but those are the biggest chunks of all. Now, one of the things to kind of break out about this, okay, so let's go back and summarize. So yeah, we're, we're looking to spend more because we're trying to improve academic achievement for kids. Um, we're also spending more because uh, inflation, you know, heating oil is up, uh, fuel oil is, was predicted to be up, um, what we're paying for supplies pretty much across the board. Uh, those lines were getting hit for anywhere between a 12 and a 16% increase. So, so there's a lot of that that goes into the expense piece. Um, on our new expenses, about 365,000 um, of that 1.3 million is what I call discretionary. It's new things that we're asking for pretty much to build programs for kids. A little over a million of it is uh, due to contractual obligations. In other words, I don't have any control over it really, right? It's the inflation. Um, we have uh, seven different master contracts with the different staff that work throughout the school. They have guaranteed step raises and you know, we're in negotiations now about what their pay raises are gonna be. So those are things that have been agreed to by law that we have to pay for and have to plan for. So any questions on this so far? So big picture, yeah, we're, we're asking for more because we're trying to do more for kids. Plus, you know, it's been, we're coming out of a, a, a tough year. There's a lot of inflation, there's a lot of other things going on. Um, but we're also generating significantly more revenue. Now the question is, is that going to stay that way? Um, it has gone up every year, that property yield. Um, and the fact, so again, I can't say definitively yes, but it's, it's likely that it will. And the fact that the property values have jumped up so much, that means when people pay their taxes this year, they're going to be paying more, so it's going to flood the education fund. There's going to be a lot of money in there um, for us, and that's where we get our funding from, right? We build the state, they give us money out of that fund. So it is, it is likely that that will, go, that will continue to go on, at least in the short term. I have, uh, I have yeah? just a quick question about the, sure. um, you know, fuel and inflation. Are you able to lock in prices with fuel? Yeah. Like the year, so yeah. is that looking like a lot more than it was last year? Yeah, I actually, I have the numbers. I think um, the fuel oil was really scary at the beginning of the, the budget process, right? Because things were looking like, like they were gonna be very high and moderated a little bit. I believe the fuel oil was up about, in the 10 to 12 percent range, um, the supplies were closer to the 16. You know, all the supplies and things that we bring in to run the building and clean the buildings and 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 all that. Um, and the fuel oil is a little bit different than the um, the diesel fuel. The diesel fuel was up about 20 percent. You know, when we did the calculations for the budget at that point in time. Uh, we do go out to bid, um, right? So that you know, we estimate you know what amount of fuel are we going to use this year. We go out to go out to bid for that. Um, and usually, as long as they're a quality vendor, we, we pick the lowest price, um, and then we lock in a contract for that, so that it, it stays the same for us throughout the year. So we don't have to worry about it suddenly increasing in the middle of the year when we're in a fixed budget. So yeah, no really good questions. Um, the local tax impact. So this is relating back to what you will pay um, out of pocket in terms of taxes if this if this uh, budget goes through. Um, what happens in terms of your local taxes is really impacted by two things. There's what's controlled by the district, right? And that has to do with how much we're choosing to spend on education versus the re revenues that we generate. The other piece that's out of our control, and this is, the, this is usually the huge one each year, is this common level of appraisal, right? When the, the values of your homes go up, the state expects you to pay more. And that's what the CLA is all about. Um, and I'll show you some numbers and kind of how this works uh, in, in a few moments. 
Um, but right now, as things stand, if it were just the school that was involved in things, your taxes would actually go down by about seven and a half cents per hundred dollars of assessed value of your property. Right? So, and I, I'm going to put some actual numbers on, on what that means in terms of like an average priced home in a moment. Last year, if it were just up to the school, right, what we were doing at the schools, um, the taxes would have gone down by six and a half cents per hundred dollars of assessed value. Right? So, there, again, the school has been carefully trying to manage things to make sure that we're not having a, a, a bad impact on um, our taxpayers. So, what does this mean? So, we got the school impact here. We got the CLA impact, the common level of appraisal. That has to do with how the, the property values change. If it were just on the school side, um, what would be happening on the average price home? And the average price home in Vermont right now is 385,000. It's gone up almost 100,000 since last year. So on the average price home in Vermont of 385,000, um, if it were just the school's impact, everybody would see a decrease of about $290 in their annual taxes. Now, what ended up happening was there was a huge shift in what they call this common level of appraisal. Um, between last year and this year. And what it means is as the number goes down, it means you're paying more taxes because in the case of like Braintree, what this 88.72% is saying is based upon the state's assessment, you're really only paying 88, taxes on 88.72% of what your property is really worth. Right? So they're saying you're not paying enough. And how do they determine that? Well, they take a look at where the town is assessed you at. And then over the course of the year, they do this equity study, um, equalization survey, they call it. And they go out and they see what the houses were selling for in each of the towns and whatnot. And they say, you know, based upon what we're seeing in terms of where things are actually selling and based upon where the towns are actually assessing stuff, in Braintree, the folks in Braintree on average are only paying paying taxes on 88.7% of what their homes are really worth. So we're going to have to charge them more so that they're paying on 100% of that value. So on the CLA side, if you're in Braintree, they're adding 20 cents per $100 of assessed value, so you would see your taxes go up by $777. Brookfield is going in the opposite direction. When they did their assessment in Brookfield, so Brookfield folks are, should be really happy right now, and part of this is because the town reassessed last year, right? Yeah. I think they did. Mm -hmm. So what happened here is they're saying, oh, when we checked to see what the houses were going for in, in the township of Brookfield, um, they were actually selling below, right, what the, the, the new assessments were. So you're actually paying 110% of what you should. And so they're going to give you a deduction. So just based on the CLA piece here, on the average price home of $385,000, you would see a reduction in your school taxes of $659 for the year. Okay. Randolph is at 84%, so they got, they, they got hit as well. Um, they're looking at an increase because of the changes, right? Their property values went up significantly compared to how the town assessed them. Uh, overall increase is $669 so these are big numbers does that math make sense if Braintree was closer to 100 shouldn't it be less than Randolph? Uh, so yet yeah, yes and no the this change depends upon what this was last year the CLA was oh, okay. and they had different CLAs last year Thank you. right so it's based upon upon the shift in the change so it's a good good question now what we do to figure out kind of what your total taxes are going to be is we put in the impact of the school with the impact of the, the changes in the real estate values, right? So the school is actually going to help bring these down, but or in the case of Brookfield, is actually going to give you more of a savings. Um, more, of a, more of a return, I should say. All right? So when we combine them, this is where we end up at. So this is... The change in tax rates from last year um, for each of the three towns combining both the school impact as well as the real estate change impact. 
So in Braintree, they're going to be paying an additional 12.6 cents um, per hundred dollars in assessed value. On an average price column of $385,000, right, you're going to see an overall annual increase of 488. If your, you know, if your house is worth half that, then, or your property is worth half that, then this would be cut in half as proportional. Or if your, your property is worth double that, then you'd be paying at least this. For Brookfield folks, right, if you got a $385,000 home and you combine the two, you're, you're saving close to $1,000 a year in your property taxes. Randolph, we're, we're going to be paying because I'm, I'm in Randolph as, as well, uh, 379 additional dollars on average price home. So questions on this? Some thoughts, concerns, or all the fun stuff, huh? And yeah, there, it's big changes. Now, to make sure that people understand it's not just our towns. Um, if you look across the state, um, being around 85% for a CLA is kind of about where the average is. So the values in real estate wasn't just here. It was across the entire state that people saw these dramatic shifts. Um, some of the towns um, are going to be paying significantly more than this. Um, the Stowe's and the Killington's because the property demand is really high in those areas. Um, so they, they've got some pretty catastrophic uh, taxes that they're going to be looking at for next year. So when you go to vote um, on, in March, um, one of the things that you'll be voting on is whether or not to accept the district budget. And so this is kind of breaking down, you know, what the district budget uh, is that we're asking for um, and what are the components of that that actually go into what your new tax rate will be, just to give you some information so you can go informed. Um, the other thing that you'll be voting on are what are called sur surplus and reserve funds. Surplus funds are any monies that we have left over at the end of the budget year. And the last couple of years, we've had huge surpluses because we've been receiving so much grant money. Um, it kind of, you know, we have to plan out what we need. We have to ask the taxpayers for it, and the grant money comes in, or we get reimbursed for things that we didn't expect we were going to get reimbursed for. So we have had large surpluses, and I'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing with that. And that actually gets back to your question about, you know, is this going to change dramatically in a couple of years? Because we've been using it to make sure that we buffer the taxpayers if that dramatic change happens. Um, so there's surplus. It's the money that you have left over at the end of the year. That surplus, you can do one of two things with it. Um, you can roll it into the next year to help offset people's taxes, which is something that we have been doing to try to help the taxpayers out. Um, or the voters on Mar in March can vote to have some of that money go into reserve funds. And so we have various reserve funds. We put money aside so that if we get a big bill, like the heating system that crapped out on us at um, the high school, uh, we have the money available to do that repair without having to go back out to the taxpayers and ask for more to go out to bond. So we've always got that money available. So um, has, has that issue diminished? Uh, to what level? Uh, so the, the heating issue itself? Yeah. Um, it has been completely corrected. Um, so it, everything is up and running the way that it should. The, the overall cost actually came in less than we thought. I got the, the final numbers the other day. It was about a quarter million. Sorry, Lee, that wasn't my question. Yep. It was, has that, has that impact, how has that impacted the um, state of the reserve that we have? Ah. Has it used it all or yep. most or? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you those actual numbers. For that particular reserve fund, um, that's the facilities reserve fund. We usually keep about $3 million in it. Um, so it was a quarter million for that repair. So it actually came in under what we thought. Um, one of the reasons that that took so long was because about 25 years ago, they put in a wood chip boiler. Um, and the company that built that wood chip boiler went out of business. When they put it in, they connected it to the normal heating system at the high school so that it was kind of all one unit. And so when it crapped out on us, we didn't have the ability to get the parts. They had to actually be fabricated from scratch. And so that's why the, the wait time. Um, didn't use standard parts, um, had to go get them fabricated, and people actually really worked their tails off. We're going to be sending a big thank you out to everybody that worked with us, the, the other towns as well as um, the contractors that we worked with because of how they pulled things together. Because it was looking like it was going to be a, a five to six month project at the beginning. So, good questions. So, one of the things. Um, Again, that we'll be voting on is, is a little bit of what to do with the, the surplus funding. 
So at the end of last year, when last year's budget concluded on June 30th, um, we have a $1.3 million surplus. And so in working with the board and, and kind of talking with folks, what we've decided to do with it is we're going to take $1.05 million of it and we're going to use it to help further subsidize people's taxes for the next three years. So we've we're going to be taking this amount of money, dividing it up into three equal parts, which is about 350000 and we're going to add that to offsetting people's taxes next year, the year after, and the year after that. So that's going to help bring people's taxes down. The remainder is going to go into kind of various reserve accounts that we have for different purposes, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, because those are things that folks need to specifically vote on. So. This is how we've been using surplus money um, at the end of uh, each of the years. We've been taking a, a good amount of it because it's taxpayer money. And we've actually been using it to feed back into the, the, the next year's budget so that you don't have to pay as much in taxes. Um, and so, right, we took the money in, that came at the end of 2019-2020. This was, I believe, kind of the first real impact year from COVID. Um, so we put a big chunk of, of it there that helped subsidize this budget. And then the year after, we took 413000 of that that was remaining, subsidized the current budget that we're in. And we still have a little bit left over to subsidize next year's budget. And then the next year that came along, we built it and did it out for three years. And then this year that came along, we built it out for three years. So you see how we slowly built things up, right? so that we're constantly having a good amount of, of money go back and subsidize folks. Well, should these, these, uh, these surpluses ever kind of run out, what will happen is we'll also have three years of slowly declining subsidies that we'll be able to do internal changes to compensate for. So it's not like we would have this catastrophic cliff here. So there was a lot of planning and a lot of thought that went into this. To be honest, um, I don't see this pattern changing anytime soon. You know, we, we probably won't be having $1.3 million surpluses every year, but we'll probably be having five, 500 uh, to six, 700,000 that we'll be able to split it to do this with. And again, the most appropriate thing is to, to try to put the majority of it back in to help out the taxpayers. Uh, reserve fund additions. So these are our reserve fund accounts that we have. Um, so March 7th, people actually vote to put money into these if we're asking for it. Um, we have a reserve fund that covers our vehicles and our buses so that we can replace them um, when needed. So there's 867000 in there for right now. We have no need to add any more. Um, a new bus is about $85,000. We could replace the whole fleet and still probably have a little bit left over. Um, usually what we try to do is we try to replace uh, the, the oldest one or two each year. Um, just to make sure that none of them are getting more than about six or seven years old. In the building maintenance uh, fund right now, there's 3.2 million. Um, we spent a quarter million um, on the heat. Um, we also have a major repair to do in terms of the high school field house that's coming up next year. We're actually gonna be asking the board to approve reserve funds for that. So that'll be about a $300,000 repair. Uh, we need to replace the bleachers. We have water that's coming in um, underneath the floorboards. Um, it's actually coming up through the foundations. So we've had folks come out and you know, drill in and, and, and tell us what we need to do to get it fixed. And that's for the safety of the kids. So we are um, going to ask the voters to approve 100000 to put over in the building and maintenance um, to help kind of offset what we're spending out of it. We try to keep enough in here to make sure that we can replace a, a roof on uh, a school building when the time comes. Uh, our roof is about a, is about a million bucks, um, including mechanicals. So we've got more than enough. Um, we've put aside for a legal fund for over a couple of years. We've never really had to touch it. Um, a lot of it at that time was due to the fact that we were having these um, much faster pace of negotiations with the unions. Right? It costs a lot to have negotiations because you've got the lawyers sitting at the table. There's those fees. Um, and during COVID, as well as uh, the fact that the state took over how they want to negotiate health care, we were kind of doing negotiations every year or every two years instead of every three or four. Um, and so that was the, the holdout for that. We're suggesting putting another 50000 in there. We're going to be asking the taxpayers to do that from the surplus. 
um, because we've had a lot of HR issues uh, for the past three years under COVID. You know, we had a lot of people across the country, it happened, teachers left, and then the pool that remains, the quality isn't as high. We've had some really good people, but you tend to have more HR issues, and lots of times you've got to get legal involved when that happens. Um, special education fund. Um, the state has changed how they provide funding to us to help serve our special education students. Um, in the old days, what they would do is they would reimburse us. So if we had a student that had you know, severe needs, um, we were guaranteed that the state was going to give us a significant portion of that back so that it didn't you know, take all the money out of the budget that we had planned a year in advance. They have moved to what's called the block grant system. They give us one chunk of money at the beginning of the school year, and that's it. Um, there's only reimbursement in extreme cases. So we have a district where we have students that will move in in the middle of the year and or move out, and a lot of them are typically high need. So if I get my block set of money that's helping me get through the year for the kids that I currently have, and all of a sudden I get two or three students that have a lot of needs, and each student's going to cost you know 180,000 a student to cover. I'm going to have problems, and so I devised creating this reserve fund to be able to cover um, and have money available to cover for those potentialities. And then the operation fund here. Um, this is pretty much the, the 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 account that we put the money in that we're using to subsidize budgets over the next couple. So, right, we have money that we're spending for next year, but we need a place for the money to sit for the, the, the two future years, and so that's what we're doing. So questions on, on surplus and reserve? And we are in very healthy shape here. A matter of fact, we're at the point where we're looking at some bigger projects because we've got more than we need in some of these accounts, and we want to make sure that it's actually going into serving the kids um, as much as we can. That's it in budget, unless there's specifics. <coughs> Didn't see too many jaws drop when we talked about the tax rate, so that's a good sign. <laughs> All right, so um, I, what I did is I handed out, because uh, this is more of a kind of informal discussion, but I can go into as much detail as folks want. Um, one of the things, I've been talking a little bit more about it with the cabinet, but one of the things uh, that was kind of painfully obvious when I started a while back was that the district itself, um, it didn't do a lot of the things that normal schools do, right? You know, we go back five, six years now, um, you know, we were one of the lowest performing in the state. Um, those scores have gone up, um, not, not as fast as we'd like, uh, but they have been improving. But a lot of it has been years of trying to build in the structures that didn't exist here. And when I talk about the things that normal schools do, we didn't have textbooks. For the most part, with the exception of elementary, we didn't have curriculum. We didn't have uh, any kind of program materials for the teachers to use. There was no real specific homework policy. There was no consistent ways of grading and grade books. And, there's no testing, assessment systems. I mean, those are all things that have been built over the last couple of years that normal schools do. Um, so those things are in place now, and we're at a point where we can look at things that are going to specifically um, and very directly potentially impact the learning of students in the classroom level. And so that's the reason that we're kind of looking at this whole policy um, at this point in time. Um, the basic gist of, of homework is, you know, there's a lot of research on both sides. Um, the basic gist of a lot of it is that if the homework is of high quality, and homework may not even be the best word for it, you know, it's, it's independent work for students. Um, if it's of quite high quality, it does have an impact. Um, if it's of questionable quality or, or if uh, a school district is just putting uh, an amount of time, right, every sixth grader is going to do an hour a night, um, that is typically a very bad thing because it has nothing to do with the quality. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing with this homework policy is homework is very effective at extending the time on learning that students have. Right? There's only so much time in a day that the students are having direct contact with the teachers within the classroom. 
um, right? And that's real productive time. They do a lot of learning then. Um, but if we can get them to spend some time, you know, regularly after school engaged in some learning activities, we are actually going to be able to increase, you know, what they're learning, how deep they're learning it, um, just because of that extended time that they're in contact with the course material. Um, you know, a lot of uh, the high-performing schools, I'd thrown that in there on the last page, and I am not recommending this. I do not believe in a time policy uh, in any way, shape, or form. But when you go and examine the highest-performing schools in the country, you can see the amount of time that they're expecting the kids to put in, in above and beyond. Um, and in some cases, uh, that time that they're putting in is actually doub doubling um, the amount of contact they have with the content that they're of the time that you're spending during the day and they're doubling it with the time that you're spending. So kind of with that as a real simple kind of broad overview, of let's have a discussion about that, about what people feel and what people think. Um, you know, what is, what is it that you think you'd like to see and what is it that you think, you know, in, in no uncertain terms should we be doing, you know, should it look like this? And so I'll open it up and I'm going to get my notes. So I'm happy to start. My name is Bill. I've got a seventh grader and a fifth grader. Yeah. Um, and your name has come up in our house uh, was a week or two ago. So my, what horrible thing that I do my now? My son came in and he said something like, my Lane Millington is making our teachers grade our homework. And he was very upset with me. Uh, having said that, um, I know from my own experience how important that the homework is, especially as you get into later years in school. So I think it's great that there's a policy. I think it's great that it's going to be enforced, I hope, across the board. Um, some teachers go way overboard if they're left to their own devices, and some do nothing. So having a consistently applied policy, I think, is very important. Um, I think the kids need to be able to anticipate um, how much homework they're going to have on a regular basis so that they can plan. <clears throat> I think parents need to have access to some way to look at the assignments their kids are um, are supposed to do, um, and I think that there should be a way for parents to provide feedback to the teachers, because my kids will say things to me that they will not say to their teachers about the utility or lack thereof of the assignments that they've been given. Um, so I think there should be some feedback mechanism, um, and I'm glad to hear that you don't think that there's a a time-based uh, because you know the time it takes students to do things varies so widely. Um, I think that that would be a mistake. Um, so I I think homework is good. It's onerous, um, but I know I learned more from homework than I ever did from the classroom instruction I had um, because you just you're doing it on your own terms at your own speed. And so I'm, I'm I'm I hate for my kids that it's you know going to be a bigger <laughs> issue, but I, I, I think it's a great thing. Looking at the, the Vermont school rankings and seeing that Randolph wasn't even on the list because it was so poor performing, um, <clears throat> I, I'm terrified for my kids' future. Um, yeah. I, I need them to be well educated. They need it, and I think that's a big component of it. Yeah, they're in a, actually, what I, as we get to the end, what I can do is I can pull up at least at least some of the performance data that's right now. That we have right now, the state's been really bad about releasing testing data since COVID started. I don't know what they're worried about. Uh, but we've brought in our own assessment systems like Track My Progress and Story360, so I'm happy to share some of that with you. And the, the, the results are, are looking pretty good. We were one of the few districts, as, as far <laughs> as I could tell, the, the bit of state data that was released that actually was improving during the COVID. And that was due to the hard work of the, the cabinet and the hard work of the, um, the, the teachers. Um, so I'm going to be happy to share that. And I'm hoping the state actually releases last year's testing. They've been waiting. They should have done it in October. So I've got some really good, good feedback. So you talked a lot about the, the idea of consistency, right? In terms of you know getting all the teachers to kind of be on the same page if, if we're going to do this, um, the idea that you know we've got to be able to or the students have to be able to anticipate what's what's due when where and how and why, um, and I, I call it kind of a portal for the parents that the data is in there that you guys can log into and kind of see where the students are. Yeah. All right, I think that that's at the high school through uh, power school that that exists. 
Um, elementary is typically a little bit different. They're, they typically don't use um, uh, student information system software the way that a high school does or is, is, is regular. So it's something that we can talk about. But we've been touching on this idea in our meetings that, um, you know, the last one we kind of went out and, and said, okay, let's just take a look and see what's in people's grade books. You know, see what they're, what they're tracking and, 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 and what they're doing just to kind of in, inform ourselves. And, you know, one of the things that came out of that discussion is that the idea that, you know, the consistency piece just isn't there. There's a lot of people keeping a lot of good records, um, but it's not in a place that's easily accessible to anybody but the teacher. So, well, and I yeah. did want to make one more suggestion, and that is that um, you build some flexibility into the, I know that the, the homework has to be graded and assessed to, you know, yep. make sure the kids are putting in honest effort, but it's, uh, I think you can, build in some flexibility for missed assignments or late assignments and if the purpose of the homework is really to get the kids to learn the material then you know if there's a policy where they can revise their homework if you know they didn't do well on it i think it's not supposed to be punitive it's supposed to be um, something that helps them engage and learn and um, having that sort of damocles kind of hanging over your head all the time of if i miss one assignment it's going to kill my grade um, kids are busy today, they're stressed out, um, and unanticipated things happen all the time. So I think having some uh, give in the system would be helpful to keep them from getting demotivated. Yeah, no good. Um, and so I do, do have those, those two down, especially about the ability to revise um, and the flexibility, right, for kind of missing and late works. So other, other thoughts, other comments that we can talk about? Concerns and, yeah. so, my name is Dave Lynn. Um, hey. I run the Teaching and Learning Center at Norwich, so I train faculty in teaching and learning, and I write policy around teaching and learning there. Um, and I apologize that I asked for the research. I wasn't trying to be obstructionist. No, I, I think, that's how it I think it's good. Yeah. <laughs> so I sent you a bunch of comments. I, I think I agree with everything you, you said at the middle and high school level unequivocally. I think that is uh, true. And also, because I have a lot of experience with college students, I'm happy to talk about what I'm seeing if you guys are all ever interested. Um, because it's kind of a disaster. Hey, here's a, here's a, well, here's a question for you. Um, what has happened, and this actually would, wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing for our own high school, is uh, connecting with some of our students that are like freshmen having them come into a panel. Yeah. And as well as potentially having some of the, uh, the faculty that are you know, working with some of our students to come in and have a panel just for the, the teachers and whatnot to get some feedback. I invited some of the teachers actually to our teaching and learning event in August last year, and I think the timing of the pandemic and everything didn't work out, but I would love to get more cooperation between Norwich and Randolph in particular. I feel like that's something that Norwich is not good at. Yeah. Um, it's an opportunity I think it's really, I think, missing for both of us. Um, so I, I do have concerns about homework at the elementary school level. I think the research is not as clear. Um, you know, and I think in particular, I mean, Hattie's research is interesting, right? Because he's never said, for instance, that we shouldn't have homework at the elementary school. Uh, he said we, should, we need quality homework. Uh, yeah. But he's also said that 99% of the homework that's assigned is not good. Exactly. Uh, and that for struggling students, actually, it can have a negative effect. And frankly, right now, I think a lot of students are struggling. So I worry about the impact, particularly on struggling students at the elementary school level. Um, because I, I think the research there is just, it, for at least for me, is not good. Um, so, you know, I think the consistency on it is good at the upper levels. I worry at the elementary school level. Um, I do think, too, like, if, you know, if teachers are going to be giving feedback, I think there needs to be some kind of plan for students to act on that feedback. Most of the time, the research shows students don't even look at it, much less do anything with it, which is a waste of the teacher's time. It's not good for teaching and learning. So without a good plan for acting on the feedback, I think it's kind of a lost opportunity. Um, well, not, to, not to interrupt, yeah. but I totally agree with you. And that's why I think yep. having that bi-directional communication between yeah. the parents and the teachers is important because you can't rely on a ninth grade student or a seventh grade student or even some 12th grade students to look at the feedback and, yeah. and make good use of it. Yeah. So the, the, uh, don't, don't lose your thoughts because you, you said a couple of really good things that I might be able to add some, some, some value to. Um, the, let's go back and make sure write down the feedback so I touch on that because and they we, sent you all this feedback yeah. too, so it's written down there. We, we've had we've <laughs> had some pretty some pretty deep deep discussions so it's nice because a lot of the things that folks are saying are things that we've kind of hit on um, and so that's actually kind of reinforcing reinforcing to hear 
Um, but the idea, you know, you gotta have, you gotta, the, the struggling students, you know, you might, might negatively impact them. So one of the things that we've been scrambling around was, okay, how do we support that? You know, we recognize that some students may, may not have the best, best home life to be able to go home and, and depend on a parent necessarily, especially at the, at the younger ages. Um, even the homework should be tailored so that it can be done independently. Um, so so how, can, how can we help the students out? And so one of the things that's in the budget that we didn't talk about is we built in um, enough money to send activity buses around every afternoon. So that if students need to stay, stay after and work with teachers to be able to get caught up and get that extra and additional support that they need, we've got a mechanism to allow them to do that in a nice way. Um, and again, that may not be the, 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 the best way to do it, so we're op open to ideas. Uh, we have a number of structures um, in place uh, for learning support through interventionists during the school day as well, you know, outside of the regular academic time that kids have. And so we have those in place to try to be able to help exactly what you're talking about. But if there's other ideas that are there that are, are better than what we're looking at to help with that, that would be really good. So this, the, the idea of this feedback um, that folks are talking about is, is really critical and the ability to kind of kind of go back and correct work. We've had discussions the last uh, couple of years um, during COVID. And so let's see if I can do this without being too overly long and, and try to make, make the point of it. You know, we've seen a lot of rise in behaviors with kids. You know, that's been true across the state and across the country. And um, we spent a lot of time, you know, bringing in behavioral interventionists and, and, and working on trauma, trauma-based practices and things like that. And it really hasn't had an impact. And so, you know, we talk about we're in this action research phase and kind of looking at what the data is saying. So I think there are some very positive things that have come out of it is that, you know, the teachers know better ways to kind of interact with the kids that, that, that may be coming from a trauma-based environment. So we've been settling on, or I've been settling on these discussions with the cabinet about the idea of Bandura's, you know, right, the self-efficacy. Um, where if, as a student, I know that when I come into this building every day, that I am going to be capable of doing the difficult things that you ask me to do and do it successfully. I'm gonna feel really good about myself. Good enough about myself that the things in my life that might make me feel bad aren't gonna matter as much anymore. And so we're trying to have this shift away from, you know, we're still doing the trauma-based work, but, but this shift towards doing things that are gonna build student self-efficacy. And one of them is exactly what you're talking about, it's feedback. If you've done a significant piece of work or even a minor piece of, of work with me, and I take the time to sit down and talk with you about it, all those powerful unintended messages that I am sending you as a student that you matter and I care enough to sit down and spend this time with you and that this work is important and I'm not gonna let you off the hook for not doing it because I care too much, those things build self-efficacy. And so that feedback piece that you're talking, talking about is, is, is really important and kind of really critical. Um, how the best way to do it is always, you know, the discussion. There's lots of ways, but those are as we're kind of building this out. Those are some of the discussions that we're having. So they're, they're really good things that you're striking. So, um, oh, so the other thing I'm, I think is going to be hard is, you know, I think what we're seeing at our level, and, and we're getting kind of the results of what's happening uh, before us, is that the, the the vast differences in the level of proficiency among students in the same grade is so vast. The differentiation is very difficult. Um, and I think differentiation in the classroom is already a, a tall order. I think differentiating homework um, is, is but frankly, I worry about the workload for teachers in some, in some cases. But I think differentiating that homework is going to be even harder. Um, I mean, I think about my own fourth grader who <laughs> You know, was tracking my speaking of tracking my progress is at 98 percent at the beginning of the year, and I was like, "What is she going to do?" Yeah. Um, you know, and I still am kind of asking that question in all honesty. Um, and I, so I think I worry about the kind of the quality of the homework then when you have these kind of vast proficiency levels, and how that actually I think leads to problems both for the struggling student and for the student for whom it may seem like busy work. Um, so I think the quality is really hard to dial in in the current teaching and learning circumstances in a lot of ways. So again, I'm just taking down the ideas. Um, just a second. Thoughts? Um, 
If I can, I'd like to add on to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm Linda Garrett, and I'm a third and fourth grade teacher at the Randolph Elementary School. And so as we talk about this, particularly you know, providing quality feedback as well as differentiated homework instruction, um, I know that I never have enough time in a day. And I know that I work really hard, not only during the school day, but after the school day. Mm -hmm. And so I worry a little bit that if we put too much emphasis on this homework piece, yeah. um, that, that the time that I spend, you know, as you said, take one-on-one -on -one and talk to someone about their performance on the homework and differentiate and so forth, that that time has to come out of something else. And I just don't know where it's going to come out of. Yeah. So if we are still talking about the same length school day, I think we have to acknowledge that um, that if we put too much emphasis on the homework, that something else has got to give. Yeah. So the and again, so this is this is the conversation. So I can tell you, you know, where we've kind of landed on a couple of these things in the discussion, um, and this is an opportunity to say you're you're wrong, or there's there's a better way to do that because that's part of what this discussion is about is getting the best ideas from people that are collectively in the room. Um, so this, we'll start with the, 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 the concern that you had. So when we crafted this, it wasn't, and that's why the time piece wasn't on there. So I was making this argument that we don't need to have homework every night. We don't need to do it for everything. But as we're doing this curriculum work, part of it is identifying what are called the foundational standards, right? So in other words, if I'm the third grade teacher, of everything that I teach, there are certain things that I've got to do really well, because if I don't, the next teacher that gets these students is not going to be able to build upon it. Sure. And so my argument would be twofold. One, and this is where you get to push back because I'm just thinking off the top of my head, definitely homework for foundational standards, or definitely independent learning activities, whatever we want to call it. This homework doesn't quite encapsulate the vision I think that we've got. Um, definitely for those, to reinforce them. Um, the other place where homework would probably be a definite is as we do this curriculum work when we get into next year, when we take the next step in it, is what we call targeted standards. So this is everything the student's supposed to learn in my class. These are the things that are critical for the next teacher in line. I'm really going to hit those hard to make sure that I'm, I'm making sure that the students are, are going to be successful and able to build upon their knowledge when they, when they get there. And then when we do our data analysis at the beginning of the year next year, um, hopefully, you know, each grade team in each department at the high school is going to be able to walk away and go, oh, in my class, I know that historically my kids have been doing poor on this standard, this standard, this standard, and this standard. And so I'm going to target those this year. And we're going to work on, you know, creating some new learning activities together that might better able to get those concepts and skills across to the kids. And because this is an area where the kids have struggled and we struggled getting this, the, these ideas across to the students, this is an area where probably maybe homework's a good idea too, just so we're getting that reinforcement piece. And, and I think that I can't speak for all teachers, and I know yeah. that there are different practices, but I certainly think that that's the practice that we have been operating under. Yeah, and so that's good. But, it, but again, this, what's happening, that goes back to the consistency piece, what's happening at the schools is different. So, some do, some do a little bit, some not much, some don't do, some don't, don't do any at all. And so it's trying to get that, uh, that consistency because that is going to help with one of the problems that you're seeing is this broad range of skills that the kids are coming in, you know, um, when, when they're working with them in Norwich. It's also, it, it it's, um, hurts us too because that's the same thing that happens here. We get, so we can get to the differential conversation um, is that if you hit up different standards that maybe weren't as important than you did when these students come together into the next class, you've now created that vast array of students with different needs and, and differentiation needs, right, um, that's in the classroom. So that consistency should help with that. But you bring up a really important point for where things currently exist right now is that, you know, we've got struggling students and they've got vastly different needs. How do we differentiate for them? Well, we put some systems in so that we don't have to differentiate as much. So two of the things that we were trying to do, and we, we did a little bit of it last year, was we built in the summer academic programming. So the students came in and we provided transportation and, and caught up on some of the areas that they were missing. 
Um, and we've also been doing a lot of after school kind of programming. We just haven't had the transportation for it this year. We'll have it next year. So the best scenario, again, and this is where, where folks here can say, no, that you don't think that's going to work, is that at the end of the year, or close to the end of the year, we do a, a broad diagnostic assessment with Track My Progress or some uh, one of the other assessment tools that we have. And we we're then able to start identifying what weaknesses the students have. And then what's going to happen is when you lay all those students out, oh, you know, I got 100 students here and 50 of them all have the same weaknesses. I'm putting you in this pile. I got 25 that all have pretty similar weaknesses. I'm putting you here and I'm putting you here. And so what we can do with that knowledge is that when the students go to the after school academic programming and the summer academic programming, we fix those problems and we fix those skills. So that when those students go back into the teacher's classroom, the next teacher's classroom in line, they don't have such a broad array of differences anymore. Or the other thing that we could do is that if we know these students have these deficiencies, you all go together with the same teacher. Right? Thank you. So th this whole you know, 18th, 19th century concept of having kids of the same age moving around, that, that may have worked good when you were training clerks for the British Empire. But that's not what we're doing anymore. Yeah. So why are we doing things by age instead of by proficiency level and by need? I, I, I there, well, there, so there, depending upon the age, there, there's the social aspect of it too that we don't want to. Yeah, I, I to totally get that, and I'm the one who would minimize the importance of that just by virtue of who yeah. I am. But um, <laughs> is putting a freshman in, put, putting a freshman in a class full of seniors. Yeah, that's going to be an entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so getting to what Linda was saying about limited hours, limited minutes, limited yeah. seconds in every day, um, and what you said before about the trauma-based interventions that were tried, I hear from my kids about the levels of chaos that they experience on a daily basis in their classroom, and it is not fair. Now I am, I have nothing against special education. I'm gonna, uh, I, and not, I, not, not all of it. I'm not all say this because I've majority of them aren't lot. necessarily special education. Kids. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, but so but no. it, you're right. It's not. I'm in agreement. It's with not you. special ed. It's it's kids who cannot, for one reason or another, yeah. participate in what would have been considered an ordinary classroom environment 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. At some point, we have to say, how much accommodation to, you know the kids who can't do normal school are we going to make because it's ruining the opportunities to learn for other kids. When there's a kid who's throwing furniture and you take every other kid out of the classroom, instead of taking that child out of the classroom, who does that benefit ultimately? In the very short term, perhaps it benefits that student. But I just, it's not just that, it's the moment, it's, it's the everyday chaos that I hear about from her, my daughter in particular has had multiple years of classrooms that are not conducive to learning. Something's got to give. And so I'm, the reason I'm laughing, so don't lose your thought. The reason that, that I'm laughing is because I, I agree with you. I wasn't interrupting because I didn't agree. And, and the story that I can tell, and one of the things that, that was bothering me, is that you know we started to say, okay, we're doing all this trauma-based work, and we're doing restorative practices, and we're, is this having an impact on, on, on students? And so I'll give this example. So I've got a, I've got a student, um, trauma-based student that is in a classroom, blows up in the classroom, tells the teacher to go out themselves. And then when the teacher actually tries to build a relationship with the kid and work with them then and there and say, hey, can we sit down, let's see if we can, we can work this out, do what we've got to do, the teacher says, screw you, I'm going down, I'm going to go talk with my, my counselor, right, because that's the accommodation. And so what has that student learned in that situation? Right? I get to go down, I get to, I get to blow up in the classroom, and my consequence is I get to go down and talk with a warm and understanding person right, who cares deeply about me, which is important. Those conversations need to happen because the student, that's how they're going to eventually develop the skills and the self-regulation that they need. But at the same time, we've kind of enabled that behavior. Right? You, 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 you had a bad reaction in the class, which is, happens, it's okay, but we, we've we got to deal with it. But the, the result of it was you got to go down and, and talk with a warm and comforting person. Whereas there should be a natural consequence that follows that, like consequences that schools always had, 
And then you also get to have the conversation with the counselor. But I think one of the things, and this was across Vermont that happened when I got up here, is they got away from the consequences and they started to focus mostly on their story. Um, and so that's the, that's the con those are the conversations and the discussion that, that need to happen so people can learn and, learn and grow. But if you're not careful, if there's not a balance between the two, I think we're, we're actually enabling more of the behavior. And that may be why it hasn't gotten better with all the trauma based practices. I don't know. So we've had a lot of discussion about revising handbooks at the beginning of this year and making sure that you know, when those blow up happens, that there is a reasonable logical consequence for the behavior and then you get those restorative kind of supports and those trauma-based supports. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I think my question follows your comment, um, and, and I was thinking about even your answer, where you're kind of talking about identifying, you know, this group of students with these weaknesses and these weaknesses. And I think, and I'm seeing this in my own classroom. We are doing a lot to work with struggling students, and we should. I worry that. The high achieving students are actually getting the short end of the stick a lot of the time. And I have a couple of them on my own, so I have a personal investment in this. <laughs> um, but I think in our, again, that goes to differentiation, right? I think a lot of our focus, especially because of the pandemic, has been on the students who are struggling. So how does the homework policy, or what are the, you know, we have the, the transportation things, we have the intervention after school, but what's being done for the students on the other end of the spectrum? to make sure that they are challenged, that they have extra opportunities, that they are kind of doing the things that I think they crave, at least I know my children do. Um, because right now it feels like they're being left to kind of flap in the wind. And I, I agree with you. Um, I think, and again, coming, coming into Vermont um, and kind of seeing here as well as other schools, I think that folks have been struggling so hard in terms of managing those other behaviors, those other, other issues that they have been forgotten. Been a little bit. Um, we've been having a renewed focus on um, advanced placement. Um, we've been having um, discussions, uh, especially now that I've got a second body to do some work with me about moving over to the International Baccalaureate. And so those are things that are, are happening right now and we're having those discussions about. The hope is, is that the curriculum work that we're doing um, combined with kind of the other programmatic changes are gonna get the students and develop the skills that they need that when they get to the level to take those really advanced courses at the high school that they're gonna be prepared and ready for them because many of them are not right now. Um, at the lower levels, those are discussions that we're gonna have to have is how are we going to be able to differentiate and, and, and help uh, the students that are... I mean, I think this, for me, dovetails with the homework discussion because what we have done, I mean, I think about the time after school that we use, for instance, like I have one kid who's studying, um, oh my god, my brain is just, uh, my brain just cracked out. <laughs> nope, it's, it's uh, tough and we've been sitting at the end of the day. Uh, so. so he plays D&D, &D, uh, and he's studying probability to kind of figure out when these dice are going to roll. Right? And so one of the things we do, we have time to right, explore those interests, to do those things, because frankly, he doesn't come home with homework ever, ever, from the middle school. Um, and so we, you know, and I admit we're in a privileged position, have been able to use that time to pursue their interests and supplement their education because they're not burdened by busy, what I often see as busy work that is what homework looks like, even at the college level, they often look like busy work. Um, and so I worry. I worry about what the, maybe a lack of consistency, what the quality of that homework's gonna look like, how that might impinge on the things that we're able to do to supplement the education in ways that I think is necessary, given what we're seeing at the time. Um, and I think that's really, I, I understand it for the middle of my high school. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about that element of it at the elementary school level. Um, but I think for me, that's, that's, a, big, that's a big concern. So to try to pull a little, little bit at it, so it sounds like, so I'm not misreading it, it sounds like what you're saying is that in terms of at least what you're seeing with your own, own, own students, your own children, that you know that after school time might be a very beneficial way to build in the yeah. additional. Yeah. Right, there's a lot of reading that gets done. There's, I mean, we do all kinds of stuff all that time that I think supplements their education and reinforces their education and furthers it in a way that's important. Um, 
which is fabulous, and, <laughs> and in the dream world, yeah, all parents that. would be able to do that. Yeah, all I know. Families I know. Would be. Oh, and that's not to say that you shouldn't do that, because I certainly don't believe that we should go to the lowest common denominator. But I also have to express a concern for equity for families that I know. I, 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 I know acknowledge you do. our privilege. Yeah, I, yeah, I so, absolutely I don't, don't mean but that's, to. Yeah. yeah, that's for the homework thing, right? So like the, I, to me, like the homework gives us that time. And at the elementary level, I don't really see the research that reinforces the value of it. So you know, before 11 years old, which I think the research is really clear, it's very questionable whether it's beneficial for those kids that age to have homework. To me, having that time for people who have it is beneficial, and it doesn't actually benefit the other kids to have the homework. So I question the value of it at those levels. So the, oops, sorry. I was just going to say, with probably the, I would say the exception of reading and other basic skills that. Yeah, I think it depends on the homework. Yeah. I, th I think some of it depends on what our vision is homework. You know, for 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 a lower grade elementary, um, you know student, you know, so grades, you know, kind of kindergarten through two, you know, ho homework might be going home and, and, and playing a math game with dice with the parents for 15 minutes, you know. And so so that vision of, of what it is and what it could be, you know, I, that's why I hate, we hate using the word homework because it conjures the visions that we all had when we were, we were back <laughs> in school. Um, but that, that has benefits on mul multiple levels potentially because, you know, that social interaction that they're having with parents that they might not. You know, that's a big piece at that level. It's a little bit different for, for the high schoolers. Uh, but the, the, the piece about the, the after school programming and the equity, you know, that is one of the ways that, you know, we could adapt the fact that we've got those, those uh, activity buses at the end of the day, right? So we could build in programming at the end of the day that's high level and middle level and, and helping students with recovery. And they could spend the time to go in and, and, and do that work with, with, with their teachers right then and there, and then they've got the transportation home after. So does that mean, I mean, I will say traditionally, Brookfield has been uh, left out in the cold because anything that takes place at Randolph, we're yep. the last bus, nope, which means is... the kids can't get bus there. So, you know, the kids, like when we were looking at First Lego League, it was going to be after school program, couldn't yeah. be bus, right? So does that, is that different now for Brookfield School? Yeah, it's been, been, been different here for a, a, a little while. Um, we've been trying to actually make sure that the equality is here that you did not have. That's been a, a big project of mine kind of since I started. Remember when we started here, my first year, we were actually talking potentially about shutting Brookfield down um, because I think the enrollment was in the 40s. Yeah, uh, when we got here with our three kids, so you, they were like, yeah, the school can stay open. So, so everybody, and again, you, so, so the way the way that I talk about stuff is I process out loud. So you know I'll I'll, I'll talk and it may not be what I, I I mean at that point in time as I'm thinking my way through it. But so you know trying to have that discussion, everybody got really upset and it's like oh god I touched on a nerve here. Um, but the the reality was is you know it, it sparked some really good conversations and so then the we changed tactics and said fine then, then, then what we're going to do is we're going to try to make things make things better so that the enrollments go up and you're sitting at 80 something right now. So, and that was the same thing at Brookfield. You know, until this, this last year, um, that's the other thing is the enrollments in the district have been steadily, but they're kind of funny, they go like this, but the overall trend is we're gaining, you know, I think it's about seven, eight students a year district-wide. Um, and so, you know, we, we've had that enrollment increase, mm -hmm. which has helped a lot with the budgets too. So the, the, mm -hmm. there's been significant investment so am I to understand there is a bus currently that an after school student If take? the budget passes, there will be next oh, okay. year. for next year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's been a long time coming. Yeah. And that wasn't, uh, and that, that'll be for all three schools, Brookfield, Randolph, and, um, and Braintree, and uh, kind of based upon the model that, that we did with some of the summer programming here. So they may not go to every stop that you're used to, but what we'll do is we'll set them up so, okay, you know, based upon the kids that we have, what are, we've got the bus that's going up to Brookfield, what are the three or four, you know, common areas that we can drop the kids off and all the parents know about can pick them up at the end of the day or, or whatnot is kind of the plan. Um, and then actually, you know, in a $24 million budget, um, that activity bus, I think it was 70000 to do for the year for the three schools. You know, an activity bus at each school, so it's like, the possible benefit of that for seventy thousand is yeah, that's right. you know, the twenty five we use. So, other thoughts? So I think it's great that all of these changes are happening. I have a senior right now, and she's had zero homework until this year, and now she has 
all her AP classes and she's taking AP physics and she can't do it and she doesn't understand it and it's really a challenge. And so to build this in, and I do think homework, a homework policy is awesome. I also worry about the equity piece of it because there are, I hear from so many teachers, oh my God, I don't know, I don't think I, you know, I can't, I can't expect the same thing from this kid as I do from this kid because this kid, you know, sleeps in a closet or whatever and doesn't have warm clothes and, you know, like that's yeah. the survival mode. People are surviving, kids are surviving, and then there's, you know, kids with great parents that can help them and participate. So I think it just has to get started. I think we just have to get started. And the buses after school are great, and the focus on it is great, and moving out of COVID and thinking about a positive way to move forward, I think that's really important. Yeah. It'd be great to see the test scores increase. It would be great cool. for seniors to know their work and be able to get it all done, and it sounds like it's heading in a good direction, and so that's a positive, I would say. And of course, Melinda might be able to spend time. Give me a second to pull this up. because it's fairly new to me. Usually they prep the parts from the screen. You're so trying to get the scores. scores. There yeah. we go. That's why. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Uh, all right. apologize that the dots are, are small. And so they do, you guys do it three times a year. Yes. Yeah. And so what this is, is this is the testing that the students are doing on, on track by progress, and it's giving an indication of how things are shifting over time. Um, the different colors uh, mean different things, right? Um, if you're in the red, you're well below average. If you're in the yellow, right, you're below expected. Um, if you're in the blue, you're, that's what we would call proficient. And then if you're in the green, you're, you're well above expected, or that would be the exceeds or the exemplary if we were comparing it to the old S back and probably the same kind of scoring system that will be on Cognio and the States, which is so, so over this year. So if you take a look, let's take a look at, at uh, Brookfield, um, where the students were when they tested in the fall, right? So you've got 30% of your students are at proficient and 46% of your students that are in the exceeds. So when they did the testing again in the wintertime, you know, you got a, f a couple of students down in terms of um, you know, being proficient, but that's because they moved over into the exceeds category, right? And you can see that the numbers of uh, students that were significantly below average, and this is mathematics, um, right, has been reduced, as well as the numbers that are below. So you see this shift of the students getting to the higher levels over the time. That would not have been the case five years ago. Uh, and so there, there has been some significant improvements here. Uh, Braintree, um, again, the ones that I can remember off the top of my head, um, before the state was messing around with the testing, either not doing it during COVID or afterwards. Um, the schools were all increasing. Uh, they had been increasing for a, uh, two years at least before uh, COVID hit. You know, Braintree was at the point where, you know, 70% of their kids were hitting, you know, proficiency or higher in mathematics and, uh, and ELA. ELA, I think, was even higher. This school was close. Randolph was a little below that, but not by much dur during that time. Um, so there were significant increases that were happening. Randolph High School was starting out abysmally well. Um, their final, the students that were taking the SBAC in the final year that SBAC was offered had historically been about 11% that were hitting proficiency. Um, last year, in this data I'm not supposed to share, they're, they're around 30%. Is that a great number? No, but they've tripled it during COVID. So, there is a lot of work that is going on in the schools that the teachers have been engaged in that's been effective. Um, on the mathematics side at the high school and at um, 
the elementary schools, right? We bought in programming that never existed before. Um, they've got the Carnegie Math um, program that's happening at the high school that they've been using for the last last two years or so. Um, Bridges has been at the elementary for like, probably a year before I came, but it a wasn't. But it wasn't used consistently across the elementary levels until the last couple of years, and so that's paying off. So there's been a big reinvestment. So we are on the track of getting where we want to go, um, but it's been a long track. Um, we had a lot of years that you know the the goal um, was keeping things fiscally low, and you know you start to put things at odds. You know when when you're not supplying what you need to get you where you want to go, you're not going to get where you want to go. So, um, so I say I, I ask this question, uh, acknowledging it's a national problem. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking about the physics example and the math, what you're just saying about. I was math. a physics teacher, so. Oh, this, nice. this will be in my idea. Yeah. This will be in my. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, second hardest class I ever took, I will say. Um, did, can't say I did well in it. Um, but, you know, I think so much of, of being set up for success in a, in a course like physics, right, is that really quality math education that comes before it. And I know that hiring people, highly qualified teachers is very difficult right now. Um, I don't know if this is true. I have heard there are math teachers at the middle of high school who do not have backgrounds, like math, math or math education backgrounds. Um, but I'm wondering what we're doing to try to attract um, higher quality teachers, especially in those really fundamental areas. I mean, and I think, and I say this, actually, let me just back up a second. Our teachers are fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> I love our teachers, but I know there's been turnover, right? And so, and hiring is just hard everywhere. No, I'd, I'd have to go back and, and take a peek, um, but we actually have done very well with hiring. Okay. Um, we, and again, you know, we're not, we're not South Burlington, um, but even before my time, the administration has, has made sure that the teachers were well paid for the region. You know, they're not making 100,000 plus like you know they are in some towns in Massachusetts, but you know they're they're making they're making probably um, especially the ones that have come over have said you know they're making 10 grand more when they come here from Northfield and Williamstown, and probably about the same if not a little bit more if they come from you know Bethel and, and White River Valley. Um, so typically, if there are high quality teachers out there, we get them, um, which is really good. Um, the one, you hit on a very important piece, and this is something that was a, a new thing for me when I got here. You know, I, I was in huge schools in Massachusetts. So, you know, you had, you know, if, I, if we had a math department at, at Marblehead, you know, I probably had 14 math teachers. You know, the problem here is even if you've got somebody who on paper and references are great and has the license and whatnot, um, who looks to be a really good teacher, if they end up not being a, a good teacher because they typically teach all in one grade, those kids have all just lost a significant portion of the year of learning. And so that's one of the things that, at the high school that, that impacted. We've got a, a, a core of some really good teachers right now, but there were a couple of years where the, an individual teacher or two wasn't quite up to snuff, and that left a lasting impact. So and again, Go ahead. We're talking. So I would that, just don't use names. So my daughter, who's a senior now, hit that gap, and it started when she was in fifth grade here. Like her teacher was put on administrative leave for whatever reason, so she didn't have that. And then sixth grade, she didn't have it again. And then in seventh grade, I was like, oh, finally, she'll have some math. And I think the teacher was quite good, but then something happened, and he left also. And then eighth grade. Was kind of nothing, and ninth yeah, there was there were three years. Yes, yeah. but that's like. But that's, that's a long time. That's yeah. a long time. And then there was the pandemic. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then with the with the small schools like this, where you're you're limited, you know, in a big school, if, if I if I had lost a teacher when I was a principal, I could have shifted things around so people could have covered for that. You can't you can't do that here, you know, and so that that has. The quality of the teaching, um, especially as we've been doing the walkthroughs, it's been actually kind of fun to see where it is now compared to where it was with COVID, has actually been superb. Um, we're going to be, we've been mostly in the elementary, Heather and I are going to be getting into the, the, the high school in about a week to, to kind of see. Um, but a lot of it isn't, isn't necessarily the quality of the teaching that's gone, but you know, in general, but if you get, you know, one that's not, not up to snuff or something bad happens, it can blow things up. 
because then you have a sub and it's fractured and there's no continuity. Yeah, and, and people are doing the best they can, but they're just not. So that was a, that was a huge impact for a number, number of students. Um, Other kind of close out ideas in, in terms of homework policy concerns, thoughts, or things that you want to make sure that we're keeping track of and thinking about as we're potentially crafting? I would just say that we need to have a lot of conversations along the way. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is Anything else that people want to talk about? Homework. Um, something like 40% of our students come from economically disadvantaged. And I know, especially in the upper grades, um, I know students who have quit sports because they kind of had to work. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm concerned a little bit about excessive homework in the upper grades because uh, I think sports are important and I think some kids do have to work for their families or watch their brothers and sisters who are smaller because their parents working two jobs. Um, I mean, I agree with homework. I got a lot of homework when I was in school, tons of it. I remember 11 o'clock nights all the time, uh, mostly because you know, of AP classes and things like that. But, um, and, and I think it does help. But I think we need to be cautious, ease kids into it, and we got to really pay attention to the kids who have maybe some of these disadvantages at home because they're going to get really frustrated, and they're going to like school even less if, if they get bogged down with it. So yeah, I'm good, I'm I would just points. be cautious with that. And when you were talking about college, I'm very interested in that. Because mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know in the disparities in a grade level if that has to do with kids from different states, public versus private. You know, I think there's a lot that could factor in why there's disparities in the same age level in college. I would love to see that broken down. Because I do believe that certain states' education uh, is probably better than others. Well, and that, we, that largely, could be we largely draw on Massachusetts, and which has a, generally a pretty strong educational system, but yeah. we are seeing significant issues. Hmm. Yeah. We recruit heavily out of Massachusetts, but we're also essentially an open enrollment institution. So. Right. Yeah, I, I think it also yeah. varies between towns within the state. I mean, I have one daughter that went to Woodstock High School and one that is going here. Sarah had homework every night, all night, like from day one. She did great in all of her AP classes, like all of that. And Annabelle, not so much. So it, you know, but they've had positives and negatives for both situations, but I do think the towns vary in their education. Yeah. We'll as say. well, and it might have to do with um, teacher consi like we're talking about teacher consistency and and processes in place and that have been there for a long time and you know yeah. we're getting there. I think we're getting there. But there, there's a, a, a couple attention. couple of good points because I spent 20 years in, in Massachusetts in, 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 in their highest performing schools um, and. There's a there's also a penalty to pay to pay for kids that work that hard, you know. Belmont, the students would be in. They'd be in at uh, you know 6 a.m. in the morning to do whatever work they couldn't get done the night before. They'd be in the cafeteria. They'd go to their classes when classes were over. They would go to their sports for two hours. When sports were over, they'd do their extracurriculars that were started at seven o'clock at night, and then they would do the six hours of homework after that that they had. And I can remember doing a play with one of the kids, um, being in the play with one of the kids, and it was horrible to watch. The kids would um, come up, they'd do their scene, practice their scene, and then they would go back down into the, the seats and they'd frantically start working on the next piece of the work that they had to do, and then they'd get called up for the next scene. And, and so the impact of, of that overly high performing um, type of an environment was I had seven to ten suicides a year. You know, the kid got a freaking B on an exam, and that was enough to go throw yourself in front of the, the, the train that went behind the school on the actual story. Um, and so there's. Well, that's not good either. No, right? and so but 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 a part of it is 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 trying to find that balance. So yeah, um, there there there's a lot of good um, there's a lot of good there, but there's also you know you got to find that balance point. 
One of the things that the Randolph schools um, and Brook, Brookfield and Braintree have really been exemplary at in my years of, of being in education is just how much they care about their kids. I have never seen, and this may be true across Vermont, um, but I have never seen the care and the kindness um, to, to work with the students that, that I see here. I mean, you got attendance rates here that are, you know, 95, 96 percent, and graduation rates that are that are in the 90 percent um, uh, range as well, um, which is unusual for a student for a population with you know 40 percent poverty. But it's because the kids like being here. Um, so there's there, there's a balance in the Conversation. Any anything else? I got a lot of good notes too. Yeah. I have an idea that I wanted to float that is not homework related. Sure. So um, I know the Kimball Library maybe a year or two ago did some kind of survey of teens, youth in the community. Was it middle schoolers? Yeah. Okay. And um, the results that I saw, and I didn't get to see like raw data, but it was described, and it was kind of shocking how disconnected the students felt from the community and how unvalued they felt. Yeah. So I was reading Front Porch Forum and seeing like the hundredth request for somebody to come and shovel steps or something, and I was talking to my kids, and I was like, that's too, too bad we're not down there. You can just walk down the street like I used to do and shovel somebody's steps. And it, we, we started talking about um, how many opportunities there are uh, for people, you know, older people who need help, um, somebody who's mobility limited who needs a shelf installed or something. And my kids have been working with me at home since they were old enough to walk, changing the oil in the car, doing brakes on the car, mowing their lawn, just any, any yeah, hands on. Chickens. Yeah, going down the neck and helping with the neighbor's animals, uh, exactly. Um, and I think, it, it's been a, a great shared experience for us to bond over, you know, projects that we've done and, you know, uh, problem solving. And they feel valued and they have skill um, yep. and they're, they're young. But I'm wondering if there's some way we could start some kind of service core or something in the high school or middle school or both that would let kids do good in the community and help their neighbors who need it. There are a lot of older folks who, you know, need groceries gotten, need mm -hmm. things shoveled, need help cleaning, need help with whatever. And I know there are tons of liability issues that would have to be worked out, but I think we're missing an opportunity to take advantage of the energy, enthusiasm, and skills that our kids have. Um, and there are opportunities that go begging. There are people who need help. There, there are kids who could who could provide that help and it would make them feel like they were doing something valuable and something useful and it might be an opportunity for kids who maybe the low academic performing kids and the high academic performing kids to get together around something um, you know small kids are sports in inclined which is where you know my kids have bonded with kids from different backgrounds um, it's it just seems like um, it's an opportunity to do something and I you know I, I realize it would require significant investment on the part of the administration or schools if they were the ones to coordinate it. So I just wanted to ask if that's something anyone's ever thought about. Um, if there, I don't know anything about it, but is there a model, you know, where it's been done elsewhere that oh, we could look at? Oh, we used to have an interact club, that's I thought, thought at the high school. I don't know if it's still up and running. That's what I was just Linda? thinking about, too. I know I volunteer at the food shelf, and I know yeah. that groups of um, students come to help, and that's either through the Honor Society or also right. through which is just a limited amount of time yeah. that you'd be eligible. But then there's also an Interact yeah. group, and I oh, think Interact yeah. is still viable. I think they're viable. still here. I hadn't, they were pretty active right up until COVID, and then yeah. I hadn't heard much about it. Okay, so. I wondered if that was, but that's a service, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a local service kind of organization open to all regardless of academic performance. And I think it's also, I have a sister who does it in New Hampshire. And so I know a little bit more about it, but like, so it, it could be all through high school too, yeah. local as well as international. And is it administered or? or it is administered by, by adult. Yeah. It's, yeah, an, right. it's an extracurricular, yeah. it's, okay. like, it's like yeah. a, but so that's what's it called? Interact. Interact. 
Okay. Yeah. But that brings up, you know, an interesting question, you know, for, you know, possibly for the future, you know, in terms of community service, you know, should that be a mandatory requirement? I was just Some, say, there, there, you could get out of homework if you're doing community. Well, there's there, there's there's arguments on, on both both sides of it, but if if you're, we're talking about you know advancing students and, and, and giving them a step up, the you know the, the the Ivy League schools, one of the things that they're looking for, actually the three three main things that they're looking for beyond you know your academic record, you know did, did you take a, a courses at levels that challenged you. Um, is foreign travel. Well, we have that. We've got a pretty good foreign exchange program. It's community service, and it's did you do something in a leadership position, you know, a, a team coach or an extra coach? And so, you know, that's a whole other conversation that we could have, you know. Is, is this something that should, if we built that, you know, should it just be voluntary, or should this be something that every, every student should be expected to do because there's value in it? I don't know. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. well, I think I'll, as, I'll as we get out of COVID and we start getting back to normal stuff like we are this year, focusing on those school clubs and like mm -hmm. bringing them forward so you actually know what's available yeah. so your kid can sign up for it. So I never heard of Interact, you know, mm -hmm. until now. Uh, so maybe they need to do a little bit more marketing or something. Yeah, yeah. You know? I, I think it died a little bit during COVID, but I think it's still there. But I'm, now that you, you brought it up, because I hadn't heard it spoken of in a little while, I'm going to go check. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll bring up the marketing piece, because we got Lance Madsy at the, the tech center. He put a little ad together, which is good. But like just getting the information out about all of us. Yeah. Yeah. It's not I mean, it's not very clear. It's not clear at all. Like. You can scroll way to the bottom below the sports. <laughs> there's, there's a new website next year. I was going to say, don't get me started on the website. That always takes me 20 minutes to find the lunch menu. It's like, no matter where I go, that's not where they put the You just have to menu. Google OSSD menu. I do, but right then it takes you to the high school one. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. I tried to the, They're not the same. I think they're the same. That's a classic school same. website. Norwich they're website is the same way. I didn't know that. I just checked they're this not. morning. I just email Sarah. Okay, no. Sarah. Like, like I said, they're actually they're, they're creating the new one this year behind the scenes and so hopefully around the center time. Okay. All right, I appreciate the time. I actually had wonderful conversations. Um, and it was, we were talking about it when we came in, it was almost 30 degrees, we'll see when this would go out. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.